Okay, picking up where we left off, uh, we're on page 365 talking about SSL and TLS. Uh, I haven't described what TLS is, but just hang on a second. Um, so, encrypting traffic on a, uh, th this type of thing is typically point to point. In other words, this encryption here is used to get to just one machine, not to encrypt to go through like five or six other things like the VPN was, right? I, I tunnel through the internet, but when I came out the other side, I could get to a dozen machines or a hundred machines or a thousand machines. This is point to point. When I, only, when I encrypt, I'm only going to one machine. And it operates at layer four, the transport layer, you know, TCP and UDP guys. Uh, that's basically where it works. Now, let's talk about the story behind what the terms SSL and TSL is all about. So, this is kind of an interesting story. So secure socket layers was a, kind of an invention of Netscape. They're the ones who developed this way back when. Yeah, excellent idea. Um, but it was a proprietary standard. I mean, that was made by one company and that's it. Uh, so when the standards people came out and said, okay, now we're gonna, we're gonna incorporate this into a standard, um, they decided to kind of rename it at the same time. So TLS really is just SSL. Now, but when SSL, when we were at SSL version three, that's when the standards committee picked it up. I mean, they could have called it, instead of calling it TLS version one, they could have called it SSL version 3.1, right? I mean, it's the same thing. All they did was just a natural progression of the things. Of course, now we're at, you know, TLS two and three. But my point is that it was just, they just changed the name to protect the innocent. They're really not the same thing. I mean, they really are the same thing. So if somebody asks you, oh, do we typically use SSL? The answer is, well, yeah, but we call it TLS. Okay, cool. The next thing they talk about is secure, uh, there's a secure shell, all right, uh, SSH. And this works at L5, the application layer, layer five. And so, because it works, kind of wedges itself in there between L4 and L5, it'll work for practically anything. You can use SSH for encrypting web traffic, right? You could. You could do it with, you know, file transfers and email. It, it's comp And the way it's designed to wedge into the OSI model is that the applications are totally unaware. They have no idea that their, their stuff is being encrypted, which is kind of cool. Unlike here where your browser dang well knows things are being encrypted. Okay, cool. Uh, they talk about wireless. And so uh, wireless is, you know, big topic. Um, you know, in the originally they came out with the wired equivalent privacy, WEP. Uh, it didn't last very long where somebody broke that. Then they came up with another one called WPA. And then now we're currently at WPA2. And there's lots of little extra add-ons to that. But essentially, everyone uses or should be using WPA2. It's the better or the best so far of all the encryption standards. On page 369, they talk about integrity okay, again. So integrity in this context is, remember if we go back to here. So we're talking about the integrity of outgoing things. Okay. So... Can encryption deter alteration? So if I encrypted something, is that gonna prevent somebody from going in there and taking a bite out of the stream or altering something? Is that gonna prevent that from happening? What do you think? No. I mean, they won't be able to read what it is, but they can still mess with it, right? They could go in there and pull stuff out, put other stuff in and, and make it unusable. And that's essentially what Integrity is all about is making things, you know, messing with the data, right? Okay, so encryption by itself is not going to deter um, any type of integrity. And the other question would be, what if you, all you wanted was integrity? Oh, you did not want to encrypt. I just want to make sure that it didn't get messed with, okay? That's all. Just no messing with, but I don't care if anyone else can see it. So I'm like sending a message to a, like a, a you know bulletin board where I want everyone to read it. Of course I want everyone to read it. I just don't want anybody to walk up to the bulletin board and you know make a change to it. So I want integrity, but not not protecting from people reading it. Okay. Um, 
Typically, this is done through what's called a hash. And a hash is a, a special thing. It's like a, it's like a, a unique fingerprint. You, it's a mathematical thing, a formula, an algorithm that you go through. So you take a message and you run it through this thing and it spits out a number. And so this number is sort of like a fingerprint. It's unique, unique to this message. If you change one letter in that message, this number over here is going to change. Cool. All right. So this is typically used with symmetrical, I'm sorry, asymmetrical encryption. In other words, I have two keys involved here. One of my keys is going to be used to encrypt the message. The other key could be used for just digitally signing, and that means creating a hash. So I'm using a key to create, not encrypting the document, but just creating this little fingerprint that gets attached to the document. So here's how it works. Okay. I have a document I want to send to you, like, like, like on an email. I create a hash, and then I attach the hash to the bottom of the message, and I send the message and the hash to you, okay? You take the message. Now you have the same message I have, so you recalculate the hash using the same technique that I did, and you get a number, and you compare to see if it matches the number that I gave you. If the numbers match, then not a single letter in that document has been messed with. If, on the other hand, you do the exact same technique for creating the hash that I did, and the numbers don't match, then somebody's messed with it. Okay, cool. Here is an example using uh, an email thing. And, and I'll, this is a little complex, and we're going to go through it kind of, sort of slow. And uh, I will tell you, this will be a subject of uh, uh, test questions and quite possibly uh, a test question on the final exam. This is something that uh, it, it, I'll admit it's a little bit complex, but it'll tell me very definitively if you actually understand or not. And I like test questions like that. I like test questions that say, okay, that student really understands versus uh, I looked it up on the internet and I think the answer is 12. Okay, here's how it works. The way it works is each end, each person, Alice and Bob, have two keys at their disposal. They have what's called their private key that no one else knows and their public key, which they give away to anyone. Bob on the other end has a private key that only Bob knows and a public key that they can give away to anyone. And if you think, wait a minute, why am I giving away keys? Just hang on, hang on, we'll get there. All right, let's say that I want to send a, an encrypted message to Bob. How would I do that? Well, what I would do is I would go get Bob's public key, okay? I would go get Bob's public key, and then I would encrypt the message. Now, stop right there. Could I then turn around and read what the message is? The answer is no. I've encrypted it with somebody else's key. So I myself cannot look at it ever again. I encrypt it with Bob's key. I send it to Bob, and Bob uses his private key to decrypt it. So his private, his public key was used for encrypting and his private key was used for decrypting. Make sense? So I want to send something secure to you. I need to use one half of your keys to do the encryption. And from there on, I can't see it. I send it to you and you use the other half of your key to be able to read the document. Cool? All right. Now this next part is a little more complex. Let's say that I want to send the document and I want to make sure that you know that it came from me and no one has messed with it. Okay, the authentication piece, two parts. No one's messed with it and um, that I can't later say I didn't send that, the non-repudiation part. Okay, cool. So I encrypted with my Okay, this is, I know this is a little weird, just bear with me. Um, I go in and encrypt it with my private key, okay? And then I send it. And Bob says, well, I got something here. Let me go get your 
public key, do the same hashing over again and see if they match. Okay? Makes sense? Okay. Alright, so one more time. For integrity, I'm using, Alice is using her private key. For encryption, we're using Bob's public key. Okay, so Bob, I'm using Bob's public key for encryption. He Bob, Bob only has to use his private key to get it back. For integrity, I'm using my private key and sending it out. So Bob goes and gets my public key, does the application over again, sees if the hashes match. Now, what does this mean, if the hashes match? The hashes match means no one's messed with it. That's one thing. And the second thing is the, the non-repudiation part. Since you are the only person with your private key, you can't later come back and say, I never sent that email. Bullshit. Yes, you did. You are the only one with your private key, and, and I have it. I have a copy of that. And I used your public key to decrypt it, to get not decrypt it, to get the hash. So I know darn well it came from you. Okay? That's the non-repudiation part. Okay, let that kind of sink in, because this is going to be a subject of a test question. So, really there's only three choices, okay? If I'm getting ready to send the message, I can send it with my private, my public, and your public. So, I don't really, even though there are four keys at play, I don't really have four keys to play with, because I don't know the other guy's private key. I mean, yes, right? So, I could s send something with with a public key or my private key, but I can't do anything with his private key because I don't know his private key. So even though there's four, there's only three choices. Cool, all right. We're almost done. On page 371, they talk about availability. And remember, availability is all about making sure I can get to the things I need to get to, right? Okay, so it's all done with redundancy. This is an example of how many connections that Google has to the network. Isn't that pretty impressive? That means if, I mean, they don't just have one connection to the internet. How dumb would that be, right? So they have lots and lots and lots of connections to the internet. So if one connection went down, they're okay. So redundancy is all about that. Um, you could have multiple paths to a, a resource, like, you know, multiple routing paths to be able to get to a particular website, such as this example. You could have multiple hardware things like, having two switches rather than one, having two routers instead of one, two cables instead of one cable, you know, that kind of stuff. It also could be things like having an uninterrupted power supply or a backup, you know, generator, those kind of things, all about redundancy. So as long as you have this redundancy in here, you're pretty much well uh, able to withstand, you know, natural disasters plus, you know, hacking attempts. So it doesn't really matter what the, the threat is, whether it's a flood or a lightning strike or a fire in your building or whatever that's not really relevant if you have two setups two servers and two websites and you have them five miles apart then uh, most likely that tornado is going to hit just one of them not both of them okay we have reached the end of this very long chapter and i'll see you guys again in some future chapter